<laughs> she said kindly and with a smile. Um, just would, I'd like to introduce you to um, my best friend and, and the love of my life. People always say that now, but I really mean it. Um, I'd like to introduce you to my Philip. Um, everybody give it up for Philip. And I'm going to invite him to come and pray for me because I need it. And if you would like, you may stretch out your hand. Not that it makes magic, but it just uh, uh, allows uh, us to partner with Philip and whatever you might pray for me that has great value. I thought that bishops did this sort of thing. You know, they're always on call. I'm not sure about husbands. Husbands are on call all the time. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your name. We thank you for being here with us. Bless this time, Lord. I ask that you anoint Kathy for the message you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Um, Thank you for listening in on my little TED Talk. Um, how many of you got what I was saying when I used the metaphor of having to be stranded in the Chicago airport? Yeah? And how that's such a great metaphor for the diagnosis of cancer or some other kind of illness for many people, an illness that is not um, a quickly recovered from, a chronic illness, or for some, a terminal illness. All of life changes. I remember one uh, woman in my cancer support group in Southern California when we planted the ministry there that said this, and I've never forgotten it. Once you go through the cancer door, you can never get back through. You can never go back. You can't change life. All of life is absolutely uh, changed. So we're going to talk about sacred suffering today. And Georgette and I have talked about this kind of topic um, for a number of years. Um, and, and it has been my passion, and, and you heard it from Reverend Rick this morning, when he was talking about how it's, it's critical for those of us who are pro-life who embrace the sanctity of life from conception to natural death, that we recognize that there is a people group who has, who has not required much of our attention, it seems, or at least not earned it, and that is that those who are suffering and yet living, suffering and yet taking another breath on another day, we, today's workshop is really about looking at that, at that people group. Uh, just a little bit about my story. Um, I married Philip Allen Young, my Prince Philip, uh, on December 24, 1984. You might recognize that's Christmas Eve. At the time, it seemed like a good idea. <laughs> and then I entered full-time ministry and then became a priest, and Christmas Eve was the busiest day of the year. And so on those days, three services, I would wave at Philip from across the church. But um, our marriage has been um, the greatest gift other than salvation that this life has had to offer me, and I'm so grateful for Philip. On September 16, 1986, we moved from Central Oregon, which is where Philip grew up and where we married, to Southern California, and began to attend a little church there called uh, St. James. It was St. James Episcopal Church at the time. And St. James Episcopal Church became kind of well-known because it was the most conservative, theologically conservative Episcopal churches in one of the most liberal Episcopal dioceses in the nation. On an Easter Sunday, I remember as we preached the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, do I hear an amen? Amen. The church down the street put a Buddha, statue of Buddha on their altar and denounced the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so that really began a, a, what was really a 10-year, maybe a 15-year struggle within the Episcopal Church. And that's really one of the reasons that we became St. James Anglican Church um, over a period of time. I joined the staff in April of 1992, and then in the spring of 2007, graduated uh, Fuller Seminary with my MDiv and was ordained uh, soon after that. And so I was able to serve the church um, for almost 10 years as, as a priest and grateful for all of the blessings and opportunities that that gave me. It was on December 8th. 2011 that Philip and I sat in a surgeon's office and heard those three words that no one ever wants to hear, and, and that is, you have cancer. I remember Philip and I were holding hands, and at the time that those words were said, I felt like um, 
the ground that, that we were on literally dropped out from underneath us. And there was nothing but just dark, um, almost a cloud-like substance that would not have held us up. We stumbled to our car in the parking lot and called an oncologist. Uh, whoever thought they'd need their own oncologist. And then I called my sister and said, Sissy, the news is bad. It's really bad. I have very advanced cancer. And I remember my sister saying at the time something that um, changed the way we embarked on this horrible journey. And that was, she said, Sissy, we may be surprised by this, but God is not and we will get through this. At the time, this lady priest didn't have the faith to believe that, but I borrowed my sister's faith. Many times in our journey, we borrowed someone else's faith and lived on that. I was diagnosed with stage 3B invasive lobular carcinoma, ER positive, HER2 negative. For some of the women, that means something. Don't worry if it doesn't. It just means it was bad. <laughs> and we, we embarked on a, a central goal, and that was to really um, save my life. Uh, in 2012, it was a, a year devoted to treatment, double mastectomy, and six months of really harsh chemo, um, uh, really a horrific regimen at the time and then six weeks of daily radiation. The following year, there were reconstruction surgeries. It was, uh, it was a gnarly time. And I remember in the, in the process of the treatment year, saying to God, Lord, this has got to count for something. This has got to matter. I mean, I'm a highly visible lady priest. There are people who are looking at me. I'm the one that's preached on faith all of these years, and they're watching me to see if I really meant it. <laughs> and God, it's got to it's gotta count for somebody else other than us. And the Lord put it on my heart, and in 2013, I established a ministry called Cancer with Compassion. Dear ones, I just stuck a yard sign out in my yard that said, Faith-Based Cancer Support this Thursday and 20 people from the neighborhood showed up. That group still is meeting twice a month uh, with uh, t between 12 and 20 members coming each, each time that they meet. And I began to teach on, on this. I went to Cancer Treatment Centers of America where they are training chaplains and pastors on how to reach out to people who have cancer. Um, this particular area of ministry has become a passion for me after I retired from congregational ministry. It's really the only ministry that I do now. And I have found that it is low-hanging fruit. Sometimes I'd get called by someone from the community saying a retired firefighter lives across the street and he's just been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. If you know anything about pancreatic cancer, it's usually terminal. And so Philip and I went and sat in their living room, and this dear man and I talked about cancer talk the way that cancer sufferers and survivors do. We talk the same language, you know. And as I spoke to him and his dear wife and looked around and saw all their golf clubs and their pictures from their cruises, I, I realized that they were stranded in the Chicago airport. All the plans for their life had fallen away from them, and there was really nothing underneath them holding them up. And I said to him, so where's God in all of this? And their answer was quick and easy. Oh, oh we're, we're not God people. We don't go to church. And I remember looking him in the eye and saying, friend, unless there's something major that happens, you're going to die soon from this disease. What does going to church have to do with anything? It was that day, 15 minutes later, that he came into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and his wife did also, and we led them on a very short discipleship plan because he died about two months later. There's low-hanging fruit out there, and our question is, how is the church going to respond? You know, it's interesting because uh, we were just talking about how uh, the church oftentimes ignores the issue of suffering. We kind of mirror the culture, but the Bible 
does not ignore suffering. They're not afraid of it. From Psalms of Lament to the story of Job, of course, to the barren woman in Isaiah 54, to our suffering Savior, Jesus, the Bible doesn't shrink back from people who suffer. There is a bold recognition that suffering is a part of the human experience. If we live long enough, we will encounter some crisis, some tragedy, some diagnosis that will lead us into a season, perhaps the season that leads us to death, of suffering. And in Christ's suffering, friend, we are given a unique opportunity because when we suffer, especially in our body, in my belief, we share a kinship with Jesus who suffered in his body. I've known the Lord since I was little tiny. I grew up in the Baptist church. Do we have any Reformed Baptist people in there? Oh, hallelujah, brother. I see that hand. <laughs> And, and, I, and I accepted Jesus as my personal Savior when I was eight years old. Um, have loved the Lord my whole life, not necessarily walked with him my whole life. But as I came into the Anglican expression of worship and was reintroduced to Jesus, um, there was a coming home to the Savior of my youth. And so I have loved him my whole life. I've known him intimately. And when I was diagnosed with cancer... I was introduced to him and a closeness with him in a way that I'd never known before. You see, there are times in our lives when we really must know the kind Savior. And that's what happened to me. Um, Kara Tippetts. If that name sounds familiar to you, she was a 30-something pastor's wife in Colorado, a mother of four, and she was diagnosed with breast cancer, which came a, became a two-year battle for her that she was losing. She was dying, and she began to write books. I know it's here somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Um, she wrote The Hardest Piece, P-E-A-C-E, -E, and she wrote at the end of her life, and it was beautiful, celebrating life in the midst of a long goodbye. She died in 2015, but not before she wrote an open letter, which was highly publicized. It was written to a woman by the name of Brittany Maynard. Sound familiar to you? The first woman who had such a celebrated assisted suicide. And... Uh, Kara Tippett's message was simple. I want to share the story that suffering is not a mistake, and it isn't the absence of God's goodness because he is present in pain. She says in her book, suffering has a way of exposing our theology, certainly our practical theology, where what we believe about God collides with where we live. My heart hurts a little when someone hears my story and begins to question God's goodness. I have found that suffering makes my faith more childlike, more simple. Our ideas of God are not necessarily made bigger or more grandiose through suffering, but they are simplified as we wade through the unknown of what comes next. Last week in that unknown, I was smooching on my son, and the thought hit me that I won't be around to help him navigate his first heartbreak. I was in a public place and I nearly lost my footing because of the fear that gripped me in that moment. I looked up and I saw my growing girls and was almost suffocated by the thought of who will help them during those awkward years of puberty. Shouldn't it be me? That's why it's supposed to be that way, isn't it? Can't I stay here for them when they need me? The truth is, none of us knows the length of our lives. So we pray for daily bread and say thank you when it comes. For today, I have a little boy who will cross the room to give his mama a hug. I have a baby girl who gives me 10 kisses when I ask for five. I have a preteen who still holds my hand in public, even in front of her friends. I have a second born who loves to tell me every tiny detail of her life. I have a guy who makes coffee just like I like it. A bucket list? No, I don't need one, I'm so rich. It's relationships that matter. 
and for me, paying attention to the precious gift of today is the only thing on that list. Those of us who have gone through cancer have a unique gift, and that is we know that death is around any corner. We look at our mortality every single day. We recognize it, we know it, it doesn't hide for us any longer. And therefore, every day, every moment is even more precious. And we have something to teach the church in that regard. The American church does have room to grow, dear friends. There is a mindset that has affected American Christianity that if we are holy enough, if our faith is just strong enough, we will get a free pass on suffering. I don't know where this came from. I have a supposition, though, I'm going to offer you, because this does not infect much of the global church. They live with mortality right around any corner. But in North America, North America particularly, we seem to have been affected, if I can say this, by the word faith gospel. If you say it and believe it, it'll happen. A Christian drives the biggest car and the, has the biggest house and has a, has a perfect family. There is something that has infected our thinking. And even though we would not agree with that kind of a gospel, because it's a false gospel, it still has affected the way that we think in North America. And that's not only bad theology, it's a lie. And it's a lie that causes us to ignore the sick, especially the chronically and the terminally ill. Uh, one study was done that indicated that up to 90% of a cancer sufferer's support group is gone within the first 12 months since diagnosis. Most pastors and church leaders do not know how to suffer well with others. We have much room to grow when it comes to a biblical theology of suffering. If you want to read a good book, read Tim Keller's book on suffering. In their article on suffering, John Stone Street and G. Shane Morris point out something I mentioned in the TED Talk, and that is the culture around us views suffering as irredeemable. It views it as worthless. It views it as something to be avoided at all cost. And as I've said, that's the same thinking behind assisted suicide and euthanasia. Does suffering have value? Biblically, does suffering have value? Let me talk for a moment about being with the sick. Um, it's Matthew 25 in his teaching on the final judgment where Jesus places high priority on being with the sick. Do you remember that? That's the teaching on the sheep and the goats. And it talks about if you have done this, you have done it unto me. And he so sanctifies the act of mercy and compassion that in this particular passage, he says that if we visit the sick, we visit Jesus himself. If we visit the sick, we visit Jesus himself. And yet, American Christianity is at risk of losing visiting the sick as a lost art and practice in the church. Reverend Brian Croft, senior pastor of Auburndale Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky, offers five possible reasons for this neglect. You have them in your handouts. It's just not a priority. If we think about what clergy used to spend their time doing, <laughs> visiting the sick, and how much time they have to do that now, if they don't have the time to do it now, which I completely understand, have they trained lay teams to do it for them? We forget that it is biblically commanded. This is not a suggestion. How much time did Jesus spend with the sick? We dismiss it as our responsibility, and then the last one is the one that strikes my heart. We fail to see the value in it. Why do you think that is? And that's not a rhetorical question. I'd, I'd love to hear an answer. Why do you think we've lost that art and that practice of visiting the sick? Yeah. 
is going to do that. We pay our taxes and somebody else will do that. I think um, it, it reminds us of our own mortality and makes us uncomfortable. Yes, yes. Because uh, it might happen to us. I think that's that's so important. So thinking about government hospitalization, the medical community taking care of it, it's not what a doctor's for, right? Um, but I think that second one is just so important, that we're afraid of it. Um, I think that's one of the reasons. If you if you sit with a bunch of cancer sufferers, or, or you know, I, I call them sufferers because I get suffering, but they they don't like suffering. They like survivors. Do you know that most survivors are, are still walking around with rogue cancer cells in their bodies? <laughs> you, you have to understand that. We're, you know, when they say can, cancer free, I, pardon me, folks, I'm not cancer free. I still have rogue cells floating around in my body. I have to take a hormone restrictive kind of drug it, with, with side effects in order to keep it at bay. If I, if I go off of that, I might be a sitting duck. There's a lot of people out there that are survivors, but they are not cancer free. But if you get with those people and you, you listen to what they say, they will talk about the friends who dropped them when they were diagnosed with cancer. My cancer treatment started on Valentine's Day that was chemo, like five hours. It was a great date. Philip came with me. And he wore his red Valentine's Day sweater. And he's looking handsome while I've got my little porta cath and they got me all plugged in with all my little things hanging from the, the little metal thing. And a lovely Vietnamese woman came in the room, and I could tell she'd had some chemo because her hair was falling out. And she saw Philip and burst into tears. And she and the oncology nurse began to whisper. And the oncology nurse came and whispered to me that she was crying because when she was diagnosed with breast cancer, and it was required that she have a double mastectomy, her husband left her. Now these are not uncommon stories. And to listen to the heartbreak of a cancer sufferer who says, I'm fighting for my life and my best friend doesn't call me anymore. I'm never visited by the church. My pastor never calls me. You see, we're adding suffering onto suffering. And I think there are some diseases, and cancer is certainly like them, we really think we're going to catch it. Now, we know that it's not literally contagious, but we like to keep it out of our thinking. So if I go and visit my friend who has breast cancer, maybe I'll be another one of those women who will get breast or ovarian or uterine cancer. If I'm a guy and I go visit my buddy or take him to coffee who's got prostate cancer, maybe my PSAs look, I mean, honestly, it's that ridiculous, but it's true. We are living in a time where God is allowing the suffering of some pretty significant Christian leaders. Rick and Kay Warren, in addition to losing their son to suicide, and mental illness, well, Kay Warren is a two-time cancer sufferer. She's the one that said that the most feared word in the English language is the word cancer. Tim and Kathy Keller have both suffered cancer. Johnny Erickson Tata, of course, a, a long time quadriplegic since her teenage years, not only was her quadriplegia and then chronic pain because of the quadriplegia enough, she endured a mastectomy and breast cancer and chemo and radiation back a few years ago and just recently had another incidence of an active or a cancerous lymph node. Louis Palau, many of you might know the evangelist. He's you know, very well known in South America, but certainly for many of us here in the US as well. And he's going through terminal lung cancer treatment now. And, and most recently, Anne Graham Lotz is going through her treatment for breast cancer. Now let me ask another question. Why do you think God's letting this happen? Not a rhetorical question. I really want to hear what you have to say. Why do you think God's allowing that? Now, I'm, I'm of the particular mind that God does not give us disease. I'm, I will never go that far to say God gives us disease. Because otherwise, this Jesus who came and all he did was heal people would be like arguing with God. <laughs> I know you gave him this disease, Father, but I'm going to heal it. 
I mean, my theology is pretty simple on that issue, but I believe in the sovereignty of God. And I believe that before I was even created, the Lord said, okay, I'm going to allow that breast cancer when she turns 60 years old. I believe that when he made Philip, created Philip, he said, I'm going to make him to be a husband to a wife with breast cancer. I believe God allows this. So my question is, why do you think God is allowing this kind of suffering? And if you wonder if chemo is suffering, take my word for it. If you wonder if having certain parts of your body cut away from you, take my word for it. If you wonder if radi if you wonder if living under the shadow of cancer for the rest of your life is suffering, take my word for it. So why do you think? So my grace is sufficient in weakness. My grace is sufficient in weakness. I'll say amen to that. Someone else. What's that, darling? Because he he loves us enough to let us suffer. Oh, that, that is such hard theology. But let me ask another question on top of that. Do we need role models to show us that? Do we need role models that will role model that it, if God loves Rick Warren and Kay Warren, if, if God loves Anne Graham Lotz, if if I need to know why I'm able to walk through this, I need to have somebody to show me how to do it. And I got to tell you, friends, I absolutely believe that God wants to banish that North American bad theology that I was talking to you about. You see, I think Philip and I were living the, the goodest, the bestest part of our entire lives. We'd had a lot of sin in our life. We'd gone through repentance and renunciation, and God had healed us, and he'd set us on a path. We were good people, but we still live in a fallen world, and Christians do not get a free pass on suffering, and I think God wants to show congregations that. So when they have a lady pastor who stands up and preaches and includes her journey, they go, well, if Reverend Kathy gets it, then maybe... It's not about just being good enough. If Louis Palau gets it, who's won more people to the Lord, excuse me, than anybody in this room, maybe it's not just about being holy. Maybe suffering is a part of the human experience. Now, there is a better way. While most churches have done, in my opinion, a poor job, and, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not beating up the church. I'm just simply saying that even those of us who are pro-life have not had our eye towards this. But if we haven't done a good job, if we've done an inadequate job, there's got to be a better way. So pastors, leaders, and entire congregations can chart a new course. We can make a difference in people's lives. If we hadn't begun this ministry in Southern California, that retired fire captain and his wife wouldn't be part of the kingdom of God now. There wouldn't be a Lois Cody who came to us as an RN, a surgical nurse, very well into the medical community who when she started to suffer a, a reoccurring cough, went to all of her medical friends, all of her doctors, and for six months, they misdiagnosed her over and over and over again. So at the end of the six months, they found she had fourth stage lung cancer. She'd never smoked in her life. And she came to us absolutely scared to death, scared to death because there was no chemo that was going to do any good. Would she be able to get a, into a clinical trial? And when she did get into a clinical trial, I've never seen somebody suffer as much from that clinical trial. Sometimes the treatment is worse than the disease. But Lois said, you know, I just want to live to see my daughter get married. And so we prayed. And we prayed, and we prayed. And one day, she stood up at her daughter's wedding and gave witness to Jesus Christ that she was able to be there that day. 
And then she said, I just want to see my daughter give birth to our grandson. And not only did Lois Cody live long enough to see her grandson, she lived long enough to actually take care of that little boy who she brought to one of our cancer support group meetings. He sat on the floor and wiggled around and cooed and awed, and we looked. We looked and we saw the fruit of our prayers. We can learn to recognize and emphasize that all life has inestimable value from God. Philip and I worked on my saying that word over and over again. <laughs> inestimable. That illness, even terminal illness, does not diminish the value of life. We've got to change our thinking. The person who has chemo and is bald and is struggling, the person that's in their last month of life, dear ones, God is as excited about that person's life, that person's potential, as he is that newborn baby, that grandson of Lois Cody's. Again, my brother preached it this morning. How do we adopt a mentality that says every single life is honorable and has immense value right to the very last breath? We can and should pray for healing. Please hear me on this. I pray for miraculous healing for every single cancer patient that I encounter. But illness offers a unique opportunity for a kind of healing that is unseen by human eyes. You see, I don't stop at praying for healing. I go praying to the next level, and God, make the presence of Jesus tangible and real to this person right now. Because friends, having been through what I've been through, I've got to tell you, that has as much or more value than physical healing. Knowing that Jesus is with me in my storm. Even terminal illness prepares us for heaven which is a holy endeavor and is the ultimate healing after all. If this isn't sanctified suffering, I don't know what is. Let me read you again from uh, Kara Tippett's book. She said, I am now facing four-stage metastatic cancer. There is no stage five. My oncologist came by, but he offered few options for me. Although people around me clung to his options as hope for more life on this earth, I could see through his words. When I mentioned I might take a different path to enjoy living, instead of the pain of fighting, my compassionate oncologist looked at me with understanding eyes. It is very clear that what I have is aggressive. It did not take its time working its way through my tired body. Jason, her husband, and I have had moments of crying alone and crying together. There is a lot we cannot comprehend right now. I've been in such a stupor of medication, I haven't fully swallowed this news yet. I have upset a few people with my blunt assessment of my situation. And by the way, just a quickie, if you're talking to somebody with cancer and they offer what is called a blunt assessment of their situation, do not correct them. It's not about you, it's about them. My options are limited, highly limited, but I'm not without hope. I may lack much hope for my time in this place, but I certainly have not lost hope. I may be dying, but I don't want to be treated like the walking dead. I want to laugh. I want to find joy. I want to fight for my moments. I'm not giving up, but I plan to fight for a life that feels like living. There certainly are moments like I've experienced in a dream that I had, moments when the walls feel like they are caving in on us. But God has been so gracious in directing and loving us well so far. We will trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not to our own understanding. Here's some of my practicals. Pastors, include the subject of suffering and suffering well in your sermons. Teach your congregation solid biblical suffering theology, and do not forget to mention that heaven is coming, and it is a reward for all that we have done on this earth and all that we have suffered on this earth. After World War II, we stopped 
preaching about heaven. You see, we, we developed heaven on earth. <laughs> we developed something called retirement with golfing and cruises. And so we didn't need to talk about heaven very much. And congregations have suffered seriously because we haven't. You see, for a Christian, it's never a win-lose. It's always a win-win. Leaders, share your lives with transparency and include your own times of suffering and how you coped during this hard time. Please do not super spiritualize. Please. <laughs> Just be real. Christians, use your experiences of suffering as a basis for comforting others who suffer. Isn't that what 2 Corinthians 1 says? We will comfort others with the same comfort that we have been given when God comforted us. So my question is, how did God comfort you? will comfort others with that same comfort that he gave you. And congregations, be intentional in your approach to reach out to those who are ill. Establish a faith-based cancer support ministry. It's not hard to do. Find a cancer patient or a cancer survivor in your congregation who has a passion for listening to stories and encouraging people and in praying for them, not teaching them how to do it, but just loving them through the journey. Cancer Treatment Centers of America, as I've mentioned, provides free training, food, and lodging in their Our Journey of Hope program. The attendee only pays for their travel. I've given you that um, URL. Um, I recommend it. It was a great help for me in my process of learning about cancer. I now have a bachelor's degree, not a master's, but I do have a bachelor's in cancer. <laughs> and remember... Cancer is the most feared disease among adults in America, according to a MetLife study. I've already mentioned Kay Warren says that cancer is the most feared word in the English language. Men have a 39.66% probability, or one in three risk, of developing cancer. Women, the odds are slightly lower, but it's still a one in three risk. And the church is called to reach out to all who are sick, but cancer which I know the enemy intended for evil, provides a great opportunity for us to demonstrate Christian love, which God intends for good. This is my quote. That's not my head. Mine didn't look as pretty when mine was bald and growing in. When cancer patients and survivors learn that their suffering matters to God and to the church, it can make their suffering not just bearable, but beautiful. I want to take um, questions uh, in a few moments, it, just a couple of moments, actually. And um, so I want you to be formulating what your questions are. If it's a question about cancer, if it's a question about a how do we reach out, if it's a question about a particular situation or how do you respond to somebody when you've just heard that they have cancer, if it's not about cancer but it's about another kind of chronic illness, please, I, I would like to use up the time that we have left to do that. But I want to read to you... Um, the title of this, this workshop had joy in it, the word joy in it, sanctified joy in suffering. And uh, Carol Blackwell is a member of my support group, and she is a, uh, a woman in her 40s um, and married and has two uh, daughters. And she was diagnosed with breast cancer, had her mastectomy on Tuesday of this week. And we were talking about, is there joy in suffering? And how does God comfort you? The, the, the 2 Corinthians 1 passage, how does God comfort you? And she spoke about when she was diagnosed and the first two weeks, you are absolutely overwhelmed. It's like landing in Romania. And you don't know the language, you don't know the culture, you don't, I mean, you understand nothing. It, it's, that's what it's like when you're first diagnosed. And she said she had an opportunity to go to the Oregon coast and... Uh, went to the Oregon coast with her daughter. And she wrote this poem. And what I'd like, as you listen to it, I'd like you to hear both um, the sorrow and then also the sanctified joy. It's called, Shall We Go Down to the Sea Again? Shall we go down to the sea again, to the salty, deep-stretched sea where the waves reach high and the kites meet sky and your breath is given reprieve? Should we go down to the sea again, 
to the wind-swept, sweet, sea-swept lee, where the wild moon pulls and the sea bream shoals and your burdened is harbored free? Shall we go down to the sea again, to the ebb and flowing scree, where the storm winds blow and the tide rocks show and your season wavers to be? Yes, we shall go down to the sea again, to the winsome, crimson bree where the seagrass sway and the path gives way and your footsteps fill by degree. Yes, we shall go down to the sea again, to the seaside season's pre where the hope sets round and the cycle is bound and your treasures return to thee. I didn't say that as well as I could have, but it is such a good one. All right. I'd like to take your questions. Please have them, because we made time for it, and I'd hate to see this. Um, hello, who are you? I'm A.J. Gunther. It's lovely to meet you. Good to meet you. Uh, thank you so much for, for um, you know, your ministry and, and also your, your personal story. It means a lot. Um, I, I, I was at the end of my seminary journey in my early 20s, and I was at the Medical College of Virginia. VCU, and the um, I was supposed to do medical coverage, and I and the, the hospice chaplain or the palliative care chaplain left to, to work hospice, and so my supervisor said, "You're taking over the palliative care and call you know, during the wow." Time. And so, as a young you know young person in ministry, trying to figure out those things, it was a place to learn where God had taught me a lot. And my ministry philosophy was to offer a full cup of water in Jesus. But what I, what I discovered was where the healthcare workers taught me, maybe where I could teach them about faith, they taught me how to care for people. Yeah. Even in the most severe pain. And I hadn't realized that people who had, had struggled with cancer, that the pain levels they get, where, they, where all they could do is relieve pain with surgery and morphine. And, and yet, I, could, I saw a nurse go in and put their hand on somebody and just simple touch yeah. and massage and calm that, calm that person down. Yeah. Music soothe the soul. Yeah. And I think those things have such a wonderful, powerful way. And I, and I learned really what the ministry of presence was in, in that time. I learned from that whole staff that as I ministered to them, they ministered to me. And I remember rereading Henri Nouwen's Wounded Healer and rereading and rereading some of the, uh, not only the Wounded Healer, but rereading um, some Eugene Peterson at the time and, and talking about companion work and compassion. Right. What do you think is the most beneficial thing from you in terms of coming alongside of others, not only, not only um, ministering to them, but also being a, a, someone who is, has been um, not only a sufferer, but also a survivor. What does that mean for you? Yeah, it, it, that's beautiful. I just want to want to say to you first, you know, for those of us preachers and teachers, you know, when we're used to being up in front of people, you have this thing that happens where you, you teach and you preach and it goes out and there are just certain people that it just it's like it sinks into them and then bounces back at you. And and it's like you recognize that and, and I recognize that with you. What you went through during that season has changed you. And it shows on your face when you listen to the story. And I'm so grateful to that. The difference between suffering and, and survivorship, is that what you're talking about? how it's informed, sorry, it's how, how it's informed you, you know, yeah. in terms of, in a deeper way, I think. Yeah, yeah, it, it's really, it, it has really impacted me because uh, I just spoke at a cancer center event up in Central Oregon, and they didn't want me to use the term sufferer. And I had people say to me, why, why but you're, you're not in treatment anymore. Why aren't you calling yourself a survivor? Well, first of all, survivor's a misnomer. Um, it, you know, it, 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 and it, I don't mean to offend anyone. If anyone in here considers himself a cancer survivor, uh, God bless it. For me personally, it was a misnomer. In other words, I haven't really survived cancer. I still have cancer, but I'm living with cancer. That's really important for me to say. Plus, cancer patients are my people group, and I like to be a part of them. And so when they're suffering in the hardest points of their cancer treatment, I want to be one with them. I mean, I, I, I hate to say, but th isn't that what Paul said? You know, just be with them, be in it with them. And so that's part of it. Um, and um, I still suffer, and I understand suffering, and I don't think that's a horrible thing. 
again, we're battling against that North American mindset that any suffering is bad. As soon as we have a headache, what do we do? Excuse me, we take a Tylenol, right? Because why? Because suffering is really bad. And I'm not against taking Tylenol or medication or whatever. I'm just simply saying it's the mindset. And so for me, when, a, a, when I meet a cancer sufferer and I reach out and touch, I am touching with the, the uh, touch of Jesus Christ, and I know that. And by the way, if you're ever praying for a cancer sufferer, do not put a heavy hand on them. Do not hug them too tight and do not yell your prayers because that happened to me more times than I can count when I, when I have to. Is that, is that? Yeah, I, I think for me, it's just trying to, I think there's something, I'm, I'm coming out of active duty of the Army. And so when I, when I come alongside a veteran, yeah. there's something, before when I was a, in the, the local church and, and, I was, and I was just shepherding people, it was different, it was a different story than when I actually, you know, when I have a, a, a non-commissioned officer come to me and say, hey, I need to, can I sit down next to you because you deployed with me. You, you were on the journey, a similar journey than I, as I was. And I think there's something too, as, as you're, you know, as a cancer survivor too, you have something to offer that's even deeper, yeah. but I think something that we can all learn. Well, and I think, and I think also um, if you are interested at all in, in beginning to explore, uh, anybody's welcome to contact me. We're interested in looking at starting a support group at our church. How does, what does that look like? And by the way, ours is the only faith-based support group in the entire Central Oregon region. In Southern California, there were very few faith-based groups. So people are, are in, if, if you can't get prayer at a cancer support group, then what's it all about, right? So um, in the, on the table in the in the uh, room over there is just this is just the little card that we use to tell people about it. I, I offer free cancer classes for the community, which is good. My book is in there. This is the memoir of, of my journey through the cancer storm with Jesus Christ, by the way. Um, and uh, in, anyone who is a cancer sufferer, survivor, or is interested in this, has a loved one that's interested, we have, I think we brought 45 books or something. They are free for the taking. There's no charge for them. We have people that, that contribute to our nonprofit foundation. And so you're welcome to take one. Please, if you want me to sign it for someone that has cancer, bring it to me sometime to, this afternoon, and I'd be happy to do that. Give it away to someone that has cancer. Um, I, I don't know whether we have any time left. Do we have any time left, or are we, are we out? It's Okay, good. If you have a question and you want to hang back or you want to connect up with me afterwards, how many, found, how many learned something new today? How many felt this was helpful? Praise the Lord. God bless you as you go to your next workshop.